This is the Hard Thing Podcast. Today, we are overcoming average. Welcome back to another episode of the Hard Thing Podcast. I am your host, Justin Lewis, and we are here to help you win the war on average in your daily life all by doing hard things. We're going to help you step up above mediocrity with the tips, tricks, tools, tactics, everything you need in order to do hard things. And today is our Monday show, so you're going to hear from me and a high-performing individual who has been there, done that, done some really hard things, lived to tell the tale, and we're going to listen to their story. And more importantly, we're going to pull from their story actionable insights that you can implement in your life immediately so you can start seeing a change and getting to where you want to go. On Thursdays, we have our Thursday show called The Forge, where we actually put into practice the hard things that we talk about today, and we actually talk about challenges and things like that. It's a fun show. You should check it out. But let me tell you about today's guest. Today, I have the wonderful fortune of talking with Christian Espinosa. He is the founder of Alpine Security and also the writer of the new book, The Smartest Person in the Room, which is a book all about helping people who generally think in technical terms build their emotional intelligence so that way they can work with others well. We have a fun conversation and we talk a lot about emotional intelligence, listening, and there were particularly some insights about using your head, your heart, and your gut in concert when you make decisions. So without further ado, let me give you my conversation with Christian Espinoza. All right. Well, thank you for being on my show, Christian. I am super excited to have this conversation after long months of baited anticipation. So thanks for being here. (laughs) Yeah. Thanks for having me, Justin. I appreciate it. Um, Like I told you before, I I like starting off the show asking every single guest, what's the hardest thing you've ever done? So Christian, what's the hardest thing you've ever done? Uh, There's quite a few hard things I've done, but the hardest is probably... uh, overcoming my childhood and uh, getting out of Arkansas. So I grew up uh, with a prescription addicted mother and extreme poverty in a trailer uh, on food stamps and welfare and WIC, which is like, you can go to the um, government office and get like a big powdered milk and a big like block of cheese. Um, So I didn't have a lot of like, options for my future, so I had to create them. And I decided when I, when I was, uh, and this was in Arkansas, when I was probably 13 or so, I don't know why I decided this, but I decided I, I, I wanted to get out of this scenario. So by making that decision, the actions I took were uh, to, to help me, set me up to get out of my scenario. Like no one in my family had gone to college before. Um, a lot of a lot of drugs and violence and just chaos in my um, growing up, and it just didn't feel right. Like I, my gut said, this is not you know a normal scenario, and I want to get out of it. So I I focused hard on on applying for as many scholarships as I could. I applied to every military academy. Um, I joined every club in high school. Uh, I I really worked super hard to get out of the you know my scenario. And I ended up getting accepted to like the Air Force Academy, the Naval Academy in West Point and Notre Dame and a bunch of other schools. Um, but then like when my last game of my senior year in high school, I, I tore three of the four ligaments of my knee. So I lost my, uh, my scholarship to uh, the Air Force Academy, which is where I planned to go. And I had to work like really hard to rehabilitate my knee and get accepted back into the Air Force Academy. So that's where I ended up going. But yeah, that journey uh, through being able to study and stay focused in a very chaotic environment, you know, was uh, was super challenging for me, super hard. Uh, first, I gotta say thank you for you know serving in, in the Air Force and and taking on that opportunity when so many people relegate that to others. Um, So many things stood out to me out of your situation. So the first thing you said, your gut told you that this isn't normal. Why do you think your gut was saying that? Obviously, you know, it's not normal, but I mean, growing up as a kid, it's probably all you ever knew. So why do you think you had that instinct? Well, I believe we... We're, we have this innate 
uh, these innate instincts, uh, and we've been conditioned to think with our our head or our logical um, mind and ignore, you know, that that gut instinct or your heart, which are like the, there's really three parts of like making decisions and in 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 taking in and a scenario uh, is your 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 head, your body, which most people say is your gut and your heart. So we tend to tune out of our gut though. Our gut and our heart tell us things if we're listening. And, you know, back then I, I guess I just listened more to what my gut was saying, um, and what my heart was saying. And it was, you know, saying that this scenario I'm in, uh, which was, you know, not a good scenario at all, uh, where there's, was not a scenario for me. I, I, I could be more, I can do more, I can rise above this, uh, and it's within my control. I just need to make it happen uh, versus uh, sort of like give up and just think, you know, this is just the way it is. I guess I felt also that, you know, there's got to be something more to life than uh, this scenario like my mother's in, which she's obviously not happy. Um, you know, it's just, it, and none of her friends are happy. So it's, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, like a miserable existence almost. And I felt like there's got to be more to life than just, uh, you know, prescription, you know, medications and drugs and alcohol and, and chaos and, you know, arrest and all this stuff. Uh, it didn't make any sense to me to go to even consider that path because I saw the effect of that lifestyle on the people, you know, that I cared for. Had, <clears throat> had you seen any uh, positive examples so you're seeing all these negative examples of what the lifestyle is doing to them. Had you seen any positive examples? My uh, grandfather was probably the uh, most positive role model I had in my life. Uh, he served in World War II and uh, was very quiet, but very uh, centered and grounded. Um, so yeah, I think, and I didn't have a, a father figure so my grandfather kind of was the father figure and, and he was a very positive role model. He was a very, if you're gonna, you know, if you're gonna do something, if you're gonna say you're gonna do something, you do it. If you honor your word, uh, you, you know, you have create habits in your life. Uh, you you uh, stick up for those who can't stick up for themselves. And a lot of values I think I got from him. I asked that question just cause I, in talking to a lot of guests, I've noticed that usually um, it, it takes someone who kind of sparks this idea within them that there's more, you know. Um, the, gosh, the only way I can really describe it, have you ever heard of the allegory of the cave? I don't think so. Ah, gosh, I wish I remembered. This is like digging deep into philosophy that I, I may or may not remember. But basically, it was one of the old uh, Stoic philosophers. I th Maybe it wasn't Stoic, but it was like Plato or Aristotle, one of those guys. Mm -hmm. And they said that there are these people in this, in this story. There are these people who live in this cave, right? And they're bound so they can't see out of the cave. They can only see the cave wall that is directly face, directly opposite of the exit of the cave. So all day they see shadows of what's outside of the cave and to them it's scary and things like that. And then finally one of them is released and, and he, you know, goes out and he sees the world and he comes back in and he tries to describe it. And, and uh, they can't, they can't understand or believe him because they're like, no, like we see the shadows like that, you know, they're terrible. And I feel like sometimes that's how we are with our own selves. Like all we, we only see the shadows of life and, and it takes someone coming from outside of our cave to help us understand that, no, there's like more and, and things like that. And so I, I found that very interesting that you were seeing both the negative examples and then a, a very positive example of what life could be. And so you had that very clear choice of, you know, two paths in a, a wooded or a, a wooded road or whatever. And I took the road less traveled or whatever it goes. So um, I find that very interesting. Yeah. Um, that kind of reminds me my, my mom was sort of a hippie as well. And she had this um, Henry David Thoreau. Yeah. Um, I think it's the road less traveled. Yeah. Uh, hanging is like this picture she had framed is hanging above 
uh, the bathroom I used in our trailer. So I looked, literally looked at it every day as a, the, you know, the, the beat of a different drummer, uh, <laughs> something like that. So maybe that has some influence on me too. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. It's interesting what, what little things or seemingly little things are just around us. And then we incorporate that into kind of the, the, the path, our tree, our, our, our feet walk. Um, even more though, I wanted to ask, so you said you see this negative, these negative, negative examples, um, but that doesn't necessarily describe why you chose college and, and, and focusing on your education. Cause from what it sounded like, you said you joined all the clubs, you, you were, you know, a very dedicated student. Why, why did you choose that particular path? Cause in my mind, you know, be, thinking as a teenager, I could think like, yeah, I don't want to be bad, but I don't want to be that good. So I'm, I'm just curious, like, why did you choose, you know, that path? Probably part of it is because I'm, I used to be, I'm not as competitive <laughs> now as I used to be, but I, I was very competitive. Uh, and for some reason I, I decided, I, I kind of had a chip on my shoulder back then where I felt like, you know, no one should be able to tell me what I cannot do or that I can't, can't get into a, you know, some university or some school. Um, so I just went for it. If I wanted to apply for something, uh, or join a club, I, you know, or play football. Um, I just applied myself. I, and and I, most of it was probably just me being competitive. <laughs> I, I think co competitive nature is uh, an attribute that I don't think we glorify enough in today's day and age. I mean, obviously you can be uh, toxically competitive, but mm -hmm. I, I think we don't encourage that sort of behavior in kids nowadays enough, especially in, in teaching them how to do it correctly. Cause obviously in your case, it really helped you and pushed you to do some pretty amazing things. Yeah, I remember the school counselor sat me down when I was, uh, I think the end of my junior year and told me I was like number four in my class rank. Um, and, I, and I hadn't even really tried that hard. So I thought, you know what, I'm number four in these two people at least above me, I thought, you know what, I, I, I'm pretty sure I'm smarter than these people and I don't want them to be above me. So I, I applied myself and as a senior, took all the advanced classes I could take, got straight A's and ended up graduating number two. But it was because of, the, that, it was because of that competitive nature really. It wasn't that I didn't like the people I was competing with, it just, it, it was more of an internal thing. It's like, hmm, if I'm number four now, uh, what happens if I you know, really apply myself? Where can I go? Uh, so it's more of a competition, you know, with yourself, with me versus the other people. Wow. But those are like the external, like kind of measurements also. Yeah. Have you seen that competitive nature, especially being competitive against yourself, resurface and, and continue to help you throughout your life? Yeah, I always try to be, you know, a better version of myself tomorrow than I am today. Uh, you know, I do like Ironman triathlon. And uh, though those, you know, I've, I've, I've finished every one I've ever done. I've done 22. And um, I always try to do better than I have done before, if, you know, if I can, uh, my constraints are time and things. So yeah, it's just a competition really with it myself, typically. Yeah. Um, kind of switching gears here a little bit. I wanted to ask, you know, you, you apply yourself in school and you you start getting accepted to these different colleges, but I'd imagine you still had to deal with various, I guess, baggage for lack of a better term, uh, coming from very difficult circumstances, being in a household with someone who I'm assuming you loved very much, yet they were dealing with some things of their own. How were you able to deal with some of that emotional baggage or, or have you been able to deal with that? Well, that, that's, that's a good question. And uh, I did not deal with the emotional baggage or my childhood uh, fully, probably uh, until like seven years ago or so. I kind of carried around this like resentment about uh, my childhood and, and wanting it to be different. And this resentment towards my mother for being selfish, you know, what I consider selfish and not uh, taking care of me and my brothers the way I thought she should. Um, but then through a lot of 
deep work and, and personal development, um, I've, I, I came to realize that, you know, what's, what's the point of holding on to something in a, in a negative light? Because uh, I, I, I took this course at the Landmark Forum. And it's called the Landmark Forum. And ulti ultimately what they teach you is uh, that life is mean, meaningless. That the only meaning to events uh, that in your life is the meaning you attach to, to that event. And I was attaching to my childhood this like negative, you know, every time I thought about it, I would get like upset and everything. Um, but the reality is I, you know, I, that, that my childhood probably gave me the drive to get out of that scenario. And I may not even be where I am today if I had like a different childhood. So it, it's something that, although it was difficult to go through, as I stated, uh, it also is a huge reason of why I am the way I am. So it's, it's a gift uh, as well. It may not have seemed like one at the time, um, but it, you know, I, I believe if I had lived a different childhood, I probably would have turned out much differently. Yeah. And, and the interesting thing about what you just said there is even that narrative and meaning is something that you attached to that. You know, your past is just a fact. It's something that happened. But like you mm -hmm. said, the meaning that you attach to it, that's how, that's how we choose to make memories benefit us. And, and you're so right. We, we can choose to hold on to these things and kind of let them fester within us or, or choose to own them and say, hey, you know, this made me who I am. And in a way, I have to be grateful, you know, like kind of like mistakes we make, although not necessarily the same. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, my, my mother was probably doing the best uh, she was able to do at that time. So, yeah, mm -hmm. it, it, it's I, I think we get too caught up with a, attaching meetings that don't serve us to events in our life. And, and, it, and it's it's kind of human nature to say to attach a negative meaning and use that as a justification as why you're not achieving something or why you're not progressing in somewhere because you attach, you know, negative meaning to a bad relationship, a bad childhood or whatever. Uh, but the reality is there's, there's a takeaway from everything you go through. If you just sit and think about it and reflect on it. And if you attach a positive meaning or a lesson to something then that that serves you to move forward versus holding you back. Yeah. In a way, we should all condition ourselves to be a little bit more self-serving in how we look at negative memories and say, you know what? Hey, this was really good for me because X, Y, Z. Um, yeah. Before we kind of transition on further into your story, one last question. What What is the top advice you would give to, to kids or, or people who – feel like they are growing up or developing or, or find themselves in a similar situation as you had when you were growing up, they feel like they just didn't have any options, like you said. The top advice I would give them is to, one, one is to realize that although it seems like a, a permanent situation in the big scheme of life, uh, what, they're, what they're going through is temporary. Uh, and I think what a lot of people do is they think I'm stuck in this scenario. I'm not going to be able to get out of it. And they give up hope, uh, which is a you know, recipe for disaster. So realizing that this is not like a life sentence, uh, you know, if it's your childhood, for instance, you're going to get through it uh, and then taking the steps that will help benefit you along that journey. And, and one of the things that I, I, I wish I had done a lot earlier uh, I didn't really start getting to personal development until college. Uh, I, you know, I read Tony Robbins' um, book, Unleash the Power, um, or Unlimited Power, I think it's called. Um, if I had done that earlier uh, in high school, I think it would have really helped me. So I think the mindset uh, and surrounding yourself by positive things is also extremely important. Uh, you know, if you're if you're always around negative people, you're going to become negative. Uh, and as you know, if you can pick your friends growing up, that will help lift you and support you uh, versus ones that are just complaining about their situations, uh, that will set you much more up for success. Uh, like, you know, a lot of people say you're the average of the five people you hang around with. So you should choose them wisely. Uh, and especially in school, uh, fortunately, I was able to choose decent friends. But if I had to make different choices, I could have been in a different scenario as well yeah. back in um, high school. Yeah. 
I, I like how you brought up surrounding yourself with positive influences. Um, so something I learned, uh, you know, a couple months ago about muscles and, uh, you know, we, we break muscles down and then they need protein to build themselves up stronger from what I understand. And I'm no scientist, so don't quote me on this, but, uh, you know, a lot of people, they, they go to the gym workout and then afterwards they have their protein drink or whatnot. Right. Mm -hmm. But from what I've understood in order to build muscles up effectively, you can't just take a shot of protein and expect the protein to be delivered to the right spots. Instead, you kind of have to create a protein, like a healthy protein rich environment. So an environment yeah. where, you know, protein is kind of always read of readily available at healthy levels. And uh, I, I think that's, it's the same way with positive and, and mindset maintaining and changing influences around you. Like you said, people um, I've, I've noticed, cause I, I really like fiction books. My mm -hmm. mind starts to change a lot. If, if I don't listen to like podcasts for like like four weeks, you know, and I only listen oh, to yeah. fiction books and my mind kind of starts becoming maybe a little bit more depressing and, and, and self-doubting. But if I kind of keep that regimen of just some of these positive influences, I can, you know, keep myself on that uh, progressing path, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes total sense. Like if I watch, I, I never watch TV or the news, but if for some reason I watch the news or I see it uh, and I, and I, you know, see it on for like three days, I notice my mindset and my mentality starts turning more negative and more fear-based versus abundance-based. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The news is something that I, I haven't like mastered exactly how to, you know, tap in and, and be abreast of situations that are going on and, and things like that. Maybe I don't need to be, cause it's not actually that important on my life, but that, that's a really good <laughs> example of kind of a, a very fine line balance that you'll have to, you'll have to walk, I guess. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so you're in college, you're doing well at some point in, you know, your life, you decide, Hey, I want to start a business. Tell us about that. Yeah. So I, you know, I had a career in, in the air force. So I served six years in the air force after college I was a contractor for the Department of Defense for several years. Uh, I did, and then I worked in a commercial company for several years. And then I did, I had a moment uh, with a commercial company. It's kind of like a defining moment for me uh, where I had a, a run in with a CEO. Uh, I was like a VP of, of security products or something for that organization. And I, and I wasn't seeing the same thing as the CEO. We weren't on the same page. And it was causing a lot of friction, so much so that I was like stressed every day. Uh, and it was like affecting my health. You know, I had this like low level stress all the time. And it got to the point where I, I just thought, you know what, my health and my well being is worth more than this job. So I went in uh, and gave my notice. And I, this is the first time I've ever done this. I gave notice without having another job figured out. You know, I thought, you know what, I just can't do this anymore. I don't care if they offer me like millions of dollars, I'm not staying, you know? Uh, and again, we talk about the gut. So then my gut said that's what I yeah. need to do as well. Yeah. So I did that and um, started freelance work. After that moment, I'm like, you know what? I've got enough contacts. I'm just gonna see if I can do freelance work. So I did freelance work for about six years. And then I got bored with that. I felt like the freelance work was, I was making a lot of money, but I kind of felt like it was selfish. And I felt like I wasn't growing. Uh, so I decided, you know, the one way to grow and contribute to uh, the economy, to get my vision and, and my values out there and, and build something to disrupt the industry and to be different is to build a company and hire people. So I, that's why I decided to start a company. Um, and I had my company for about six years, Alpine Security. I sold it in uh, December, actually, just like a month ago, uh, to uh, Cerberus Sentinel. They they acquired us, um, but that journey through having my company uh, was all the growth I you know and and then some that I wanted. It was very uncomfortable. Uh, you know, it, it forced me to grow in like every way possible, uh, because when you start a business, I'm a believer that. Um, the business is a reflection of the, uh, the, the, the owner and the person that started it. 
Uh, so if the business is not doing well, it's like a mirror image that there's something wrong with me. Because uh, if your outer world is, is is not right, then there's something wrong with your inner world, basically. So it forced me to have to really reevaluate a lot of things and change a lot of my behavior, my beliefs, and everything else to to be able to get to like do these step ladders in the business, basically. That sorry, I had to write that quote down because it was it was very insightful. A business is a reflection of the owner who started it. At what point did you realize that insight? Uh, I realized it probably about six or seven months into the business uh, that, you know, I had hired a person that I thought was a good fit. I hired them without listening to my gut. My gut said no, but I hired them because my, my, my mind said, my head said, this person is like super smart. They, they show they want to like, you know, help me and all this stuff. So I went ahead and hired them and, uh, they, you know, had made, burned a couple of bridges with clients, like went to a meeting with a client and, and used a bunch of profanity and things in the meeting. And, uh, yeah, all that made me realize that uh, I've got a lot to learn in the, in the business. Uh, you know, what I thought would work is not working. On, on and, and the thing is, uh, since I founded the company, I personally backed the company financially. So it's different than working for another company because you, when I worked for other companies, I saw these same kind of things happen, but it's like I wasn't as vested. Mm -hmm. But now this is like my money that I, all of my money, you know, I put in the company and if I don't figure this out, it's going to have a dire consequence because I could lose everything. So it's like the, the necessity uh, drove a lot of uh, the innovation and changes I had to go through. Wow. That's so insightful to me, especially because a lot of people might be tempted uh, a situation like that, right? A lot of people might be tempted to say it's the employee's fault, which it is. And honestly, I don't really like using the word fault because it's not very productive. But mm -hmm. you instead said, this is my responsibility. Essentially, this is what you said. This is my responsibility because I have a lot more to learn about business and this industry and my business specifically. Why do you think you had that reaction versus, oh, well, I'll just fire him. And, and then you don't actually have that internal change. I believe in taking ownership. Uh, and the reality is if, if it's my company uh, that I started, whatever happens uh, for good or bad is, is my responsibility. And the other thing is, if you are saying it's the employee's fault, if you're always saying it's somebody else's fault or the economy's fault, it's because of COVID, whatever, if you're always blaming something externally, then you're not going to look inward and make the change that is required for your, you know, inside. Uh, and, and you're just deflecting. So it's, it, it's not serving you by always blaming other people. Uh, granted, there are some situations where, sure, it could be somebody's fault. But the reality is like with this employee, uh, if I didn't do the reflection and realize that I ignored my gut and hired this guy anyway, then I probably would have made the same mistake again after I got rid of them. Right. Uh, and, I, and I did. So it's like, you know, it's like something told me uh, not to hire this guy, but then I wouldn't hire somebody else again. It's like I had to make, make the mistake twice before it, you know, I had to pay the dumb tax, as they say, yeah. <laughs> before it, before it's like sunk in. Um, but, but I had to sit back and say, what is my role in this? And what can I do differently next time? What can I learn from this? Right. Sure. Uh, and that's extremely important other than if you just say, you know, it's their fault and I'm just going to move on and not think about it anymore. You're, you're not going to progress in my opinion. Yeah. And I, I love how you say dumb tax. I've heard other people call it like a tuition money in the school of hard knocks or whatever. There you um, go. Yeah. Yeah. But, but the way you describe it, uh, it, it kind of turns everything that we're doing in life as an opportunity for internal development, which is really interesting because it kind of changes I think it would probably change the way that you do things. Like if you, if you treat your marriage or, uh, you know, your job or how you show up to a pickup game of basketball as an opportunity for internal development, I think you'll act a little bit differently and, and make some different choices. What do you think? 
Uh, I completely agree. I think uh, I think we have to look at situations like what's the outcome I'm trying to get out of this scenario. Like if you, you know, like a, something that I hear quite a bit is like if if you're arguing with your spouse about the dishes and the dishwasher, uh, and, and it's like you're, you're pissed off about it or upset about it, it's like what are you hoping to get out of that? You know, if you're hoping to have like a a harmonious relationship and show the other person you care about them or love about them, then what does it matter who puts the dishes in the dishwasher, right? But sometimes we want to fight to be right at the cost of being happy. Uh, and uh, it, it, we just have to step back and say, what what I want out of this scenario? And then, like you said, uh, that would alter how you respond to things and how you approach that scenario. Yeah. Or that relationship or whatever it is. I think that's actually a great segue to kind of talk about your book because it's all about emotional intelligence, right? And I feel like that's exactly what you're just talking about. <laughs> yeah, the book is about emotional intelligence. So my book, uh, basically all the lessons I learned through having my my company uh, and working with highly technical people and the frustrations I had, uh, I, I wrote a book about that and about the things I did to, to change the culture and, and, and improve uh, highly technical people. There's this, this mindset in cybersecurity that if you have a high IQ, uh, it's accepted that you don't have to have people skills or, you know, a high EQ. Right. And, it, and it's tolerated as well. So that's not helping our industry. So in my book, I have a, a seven step, what I call secure methodology, which basically walks somebody through these seven steps, which includes things like awareness, mindset, acknowledgement, communication, um, monotasking, empathy, and Kaizen. And if you follow these seven steps uh, and you're a technical leader, it equips you better to deal with your uh, technical staff and also train your technical staff on the same concept so we can communicate better, we can work better together, we're not intellectually bullying each other, we're not trying to be the smartest person in the room, which is the title of my book. Uh, we're not letting our ego come into play all the time. Uh, we're working to get the outcome we want to, we want. Like the scenario with the dishwasher, again, that's the ego coming to play saying, I want to be right versus I want to be happy. You know, the same thing happens in my industry in cybersecurity. People want to be right. They want to listen for agreement when they're talking to a, a prospect or a client instead of listening for insight. Hmm. Wow. Listening for insight. How, and I'm asking as a chronic bad listener and Honestly, my EQ is probably really, really low. My IQ might be down there too, but <laughs> definitely EQ is really low. How do I you? I think it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. How do you listen for insight? Like, I don't know if there's any like quick tips for that. <laughs> well, you have to really listen. Uh, so one of the things I talk about in my book is monotasking. Uh, we so it's being present. So when I'm listening to somebody, my mind. And my soul is basically engaged in the conversation and I'm listening to what they're saying, but I'm not listening so much for the words they're saying uh, as how they're saying the words, but also patterns in their speech. Like uh, someone that, that has worked for me in the past, uh, they used to use words like, uh, it's like, you know, pushing a rock up a hill. It's like shouldering this. It's, it's like, um, uh, it's like, I don't want that to hit the floor. So there's the, if you like listen to the what they're saying, you can get a sense of like how they view the world. So if you if you view the world like, you know, anything is like pushing a rock up a hill, I'm shouldering something, I don't want it to hit the floor. That person is looking at the world through a very specific lens. So that alone gives you some insight. Like, you know, if, if they're presented with a, a challenge, they're gonna find the faults and the difficulties with that challenge instead of like the excitement about it initially. So and that's just an example. So if you get a little bit of insight into, like I said, that person's model of the world. What do you do when, uh, and I mean, we've all had this happen in our life where we are talking to someone and it's it's just something that, you know, we're not interested in. Like how, how do you switch from not really listening well to, to, like you said, listening to how they're speaking and listening to, to the patterns in their words. 
I, I think everybody's interesting uh, and everybody's got some underlying trauma that is manifesting in some way. We try to pretend we don't, um, but there's something that people are typically carrying around, carrying around. And at the, at the, at the core of everything, I believe we're all connected and we're all similar. Uh, we tend to focus on our differences like, oh, they like cats. I like dogs. I don't want to hear them talk about cats anymore. But for me, uh, I like to, to look at the person and think, hmm, you know, even though I don't like cats, as an example, what is it about them that likes the cats? Because it's fascinating. If you, if, you'd like, if, if you just change the perspective, because I want to know more about them versus like what they're talking about, like what makes them tick? What makes them like like this thing? Uh, you know, if it's country music or whatever, I don't like country music, but it's fascinating to me how people, for one, have decided to like cats or country music, how they got into that. Hmm. And then also like, what about that keeps them, you know, it keeps their interest basically. So I look at it from, from more of a human behavior perspective versus like, you know, this is a boring topic, right? Hmm. And, and some of that requires you to sort of shift the conversation a little bit. Yeah, it's not always easy. Some people just <laughs> like to talk and blab on and on and on and on. So you have to like find a time to inter interject, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so if I understood right, basically you try to understand the person, not just like, oh, this is what you're saying, but like this is the inner machinations of your brain. But also, you you try and kind of dig into their story. Is that right? Yeah, I, I try to be. I am curious by nature. I think we all are. Uh, I remember talking to this guy a long time ago. He was in SCA. I had no idea what SCA is. This is Society of Creative uh, Anar Ana Anachrism or something like that. I don't even know what the A stands for. But it's like yeah. basically what he did was uh, dressed up as like a knight and went to these events where everyone else dressed up. And when I first heard that, I thought, man, this is weird and kind of bizarre. But then I yeah. went to dinner with him and I talked to him about it. And I, I found it very fascinating yeah. uh, because to kind of hear, get him engaged and excited about it and hear it from his perspective, I started thinking, man, this is kind of cool. I want to do this thing, you know? It's really just the curiosity and asking uh, the right questions and not just dismissing it at the beginning. Right. I love that, asking the right questions. Um, gosh, there's a quote I heard somewhere. I don't know who said it, so it's definitely not me, but it's, it's something along the lines of the quality of our life will be measured by the, the quality of the questions we ask. So I, I think, yes. you know, asking that questions is key and kind of a, just a curiosity about that, that man, did you, did, were you able to ask him how they decided who gets to dress up as the knights versus the squires and versus the peasants and things? Cause if I was ever doing that, I would definitely want to know like, Hey, am I going to be a knight or am I going to get, you know, kicked around in the mud? You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I did. Uh, there's a hierarchy and you have to kind of work your way through the hierarchy actually. <laughs> wow. So there's like, there's like these levels he described it and he did this uh, and he showed me, I, you know, I, he, he, he's really into it, but he was showing me like, uh, he did these sword fights where he'd wear like a, a helmet, like mm -hmm. um, a metal uh, helmet and like chain mail. And, and the sword was like really heavy. It's like a legit sword from the yeah. day, you know? Yeah. Uh, it wasn't like sharp or anything, but they would do <laughs> these fights and somebody would judge it. So it's like, it was very interesting, uh, the whole wow. thing. Cause it's like an alter, you know, alternate universe, a yeah. subculture. And we all, we all have hobbies and I'm very interested in people's hobbies yeah. and what they pick to, to do in their spare time. Yeah. One thing you also mentioned, kind of a trick that I think maybe our audience might gloss over uh, if we don't kind of pick it out is you said he started talking and, and you were kind of, you know, dismissing him. And then you, you were able to get with him in a different situation, but in a sense, you got him excited talking about what excites him. And I think that might be another not necessarily trick or tactic, maybe it's technique, uh, a technique of really being able to take conversations with people that you don't find interesting and, and, and ramp it up to that level where you're both engaged simply because one person is really like, you know, showing forth their fire, if you could say that, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. It, it goes back to that uh, listening for agreement versus insight. You yeah. know, if I had uh, listen to this guy and like, oh, I don't agree with that. I don't like that. Then I might not ask any questions, but I approach it from a, a gaining insight and, and curiosity perspective where I'm, I'm like, it doesn't really matter what it is this person is doing. It's like, 
what about this thing has attracted them to do it and why are they still doing it and and what do they get out of it it's like it, that to me is the is, is the interesting thing yeah uh, and, just, um, and, and like you said if, if we can get them excited and passionate about this like this guy got really animated about talking about <laughs> his uh you know sword fights and stuff yeah. it's, it's 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 it makes it that much more engaging to talk to someone you know whether they're that passionate about something and almost it draws you in yeah it's almost like yeah i want to be part of that you know just because he was yeah. so into it yeah i mean we, we all uh maybe not all of us but most people i know love learning like random fun facts like oh that's interesting and i feel like r learning random fun facts about someone but like facts that have kind of a deeper story larger image to it uh, i think that definitely helps enliven conversation even if it's not about you especially if it's not about you you can you know just just knowing something kind of quirky about someone else or, or deeper than service level i think like you said really makes conversation much more lively um did you just want to say something yeah it, it makes them more lively but it's also you know if you ask like what you know got you into this this hobby or whatever you know i've had conversations with people that that like a guy um i remember he painted like little bitty figurines um and I thought this is kind of a bizarre hobby, but then I, I asked him about it and he said his grandfather did it and his grandfather had passed away and he got into it because he felt like, you know, it was um, kind of a, a tribute to his grandfather. But when he was painting those figurines, he felt like he was closer to his grandfather who passed away. Hmm. So, it's, you know, you, you get to learn interesting things from people if you kind of don't, if you peel back the judgment and 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 just like ask the right questions and really look at the, look at them as a person. Yeah, the, the, I think the big trick there is just being able to peel back the judgment and, and being able to sit down and mm -hmm. and have a an open conversation without any pre biases or anything. Um, one question I wanted to ask you that I, I thought would be really interesting: Have you ever had any experiences where you did listen to your gut and things didn't necessarily turn out like you wanted? Um, not that I can think of. Wow. <laughs> I, I've had, I've had situations where I've, I've, I've listened to my, cause I, I, I use three things. I try to use three things in my decisions. Mm -hmm. Uh, my, my body, which is my gut, mm -hmm. but there's also like the hair on your arm, the hair on the back of your neck, yeah. chills, you know, there's also yeah. that I try to use my heart. Like what is my heart is telling me and my head, my, you know, logic. So I've made bad decisions by following my heart before, by giving someone more uh, more chances than they should have been given. Cause I, mm -hmm. like my, I felt like I want to help this person grow. Uh, I made bad decisions with my, my head, but if I, I can't think of a single decision, <laughs> if I had like tuned in to what my gut or my body was telling me that I've, if, that I've, um, if I would have listened to that would have been the wrong decision. And wow. it's hard to do. We've we've been conditioned to try to make all the decisions with our, our 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 mind, right? But if we just like sit for a while and get used to sitting, your gut, you know, we're made of like all these cells, and they're they're in our whole body. You know, it's, we 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 don't just think with our our brain. Our whole body is telling us stuff as well. So it's important to like if facing a big decision to really tune into more than just like logic. Yeah, yeah. I think I actually heard somewhere. And, and again, I'm no scientist, so maybe this is wrong, but supposedly our stomach has like the same amount of like nerve endings or something as our brain. So it, it yeah. in a way acts as like a second brain, but in a more visceral way, literally. Um, but again, you'd have to check that. I, I just, I think I heard that somewhere. <laughs> so um, yeah, I've heard, I've heard that as well. And yeah. it, it's, I mean, we're, everything is connected in our body, right? You know, if yeah. you're we're all, it, all there's cells they're all connected so uh why not pay attention to the other sensors that are telling you something yeah. why ignore you know uh a couple of them and just pay attention to one you know if there's like yeah. red lights are flashing we got to like you know pay attention to them I, I like how you describe that kind of like a dashboard of a car like we have all yeah. sorts of different sensors like the oil gauge the temperature the gas and you know so that makes perfect sense yeah. Um, Christian, we're coming down to the, the last little bit here. I've enjoyed having you on the conversation. So uh, before we leave, how can people reach out to you, support you, see what you're up to? Yeah, people can uh, go to my website. It's christianespinoza.com. 
They can also find my book, The Smartest Person in the Room, on Amazon, uh, and they can find me on social media. Awesome. I will get all those up in the show notes. Uh, but before we go, a couple action items for our audience. So I came up, I was able to find three. Let me know if you wanted to add or change okay. uh, to this list. So the first action item I came up with from our conversation was to read personal development books, kind of like you were saying, you got started in, in college reading Tony Robinson. So hopefully our audience can replicate that practice. And then yeah, the other, and, and just just ahead. to add to that, uh, these days you can just watch YouTube videos or yeah. podcasts or like any, there's a lot of more things available now for personal development than there were, you know, back when, when I was in, in in high school, which were basically books. Yeah, agreed. I mean, it, we have no excuse really, uh, especially. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but I love going to the library. The library allows us to get to rent audiobooks for free. Uh, yeah. So we can, you know. There's just no excuse. So, <laughs> uh, and then number two was to, and I'm actually going to change this from what it was. It was saying start to listen to your gut, but I think I'd rather say start to use the body, heart, mind, decision making process, and, and using all three of those in concert rather than just one aspect. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then the last one is to start listening for insight. Uh, yes. Yeah. Did you have any others that you wanted to add or do you think those are pretty good? I think those are great. Uh, the listening for insight uh, is challenging because most of us listen <laughs> for agreement. So yeah. that's, that has, you have to like put your ego uh, mm -hmm. in check. You know, I like to have this saying that uh, your ego is not your amigo. So <laughs> <laughs> when the ego surfaces, you want to like keep it in check basically. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise so, you'll just listen so for agreement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's so tough because, I mean, all of us just want to be known for being the best and the, and the biggest and the brightest, and uh, it's tough. So, but yeah. thank you so much, Christian, for being on the show. I, I really appreciate it. I've enjoyed having this conversation. I'm glad that you know we got connected months and months ago, but I'm glad we were finally able to ha uh, you know have it come together. Uh, so thanks for being on my show. Yeah, I appreciate it, Justin, and yeah. I'm glad we stayed in touch yeah. over these six or eight months or however long it's been. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome. Thank you, my friends, for listening to another episode. I am very grateful for you tuning in and listening to these shows. I know that they are valuable and I know that they are helping you out. So if you want to support the show, go ahead and share it with someone you know. Also, make sure you subscribe so you never miss a single episode. The episode that you miss might just be the one that might have changed your life. You never know. Uh, but again, thank you so much for coming in and, and supporting the Hard Thing Podcast. The purpose of this show is really to help you, to, to, to give you change in your life, to, to be the catalyst for forward progress. So I really hope that it's making a difference. And the only way to really make a difference is to put it in practice. So it's up to you. So we'll see you uh, next time. But until then, make sure you do hard things and overcome average. Psych! We're not done yet. I want to talk about Operation Underground Railroad. I always talk about them because they're my favorite nonprofit organization, and they actually go undercover to rescue kids from sex trafficking. We all have uh, children in our life that we care for deeply. Well, there are children out there who don't have people who care for them deeply because they've been stolen and they've been trafficked. So if you want to help get them back, put them in nice homes where people care about them, donate to Operation Underground Railroad at oyorescue.org, or you can help us raise $1,000 for them in our campaign at gofundme.com slash overcoming dash average. Donate some money today. Now, really, go do some hard things because you will overcome average. <laughs>